Hey guys, welcome back to the Aspire Hire. I'm honored to have Daniel Chacon with me. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Absolutely, man. We know each other through the Easton community and and as well as um, the Man Talks community too, where we connected the other day. Yeah, it's uh, we're very blessed to have very supportive um, communities on both fronts. And I think like it's like-minded people that get together can accomplish something even further than we could have alone. Yeah, that's right. That's one of the things that I love about the martial arts community so much is um, everybody's a teammate first and, and their number one responsibility is to lift each other up. How, how did you get into Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu? Well, it started back when I was 19 years old. And when I started, I really don't know what I was doing. I, I really, I was, I'm terrible at sports, really terrible. And my, one of my close best friends who was a football team and I was, and I wasn't a stellar athlete at all. Like I was just on the team because I was, I just got on. He actually took me to a dojo to do some Kyukushin karate. Um, when I got there, I started, it, I enjoyed it, but it never called to me until two years later when I started going through depression and started going through a lot of really tough times in my life. Uh, something just started calling me to, to train and take it serious. I think that was probably 20, 21. I started really diving more than before. It's been a, it's been a big milestone to realize how much it's, it's improved my life. And that, that was just a catalyst beginning of so many positive things that has come out of it. Yeah, it sounds similar to the same reason why I found jujitsu at 36 years old. You know, I never would have thought uh, I'd be training uh, a combat sport, grappling sport at the <laughs> young, youthful age of 36. But, you know, I was, I was going through the beginning of a midlife crisis. I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, had a real low point in my life. And um, thank God for jujitsu, man. What a... Uh... You know, there's like, there's a human quality of like, and it, it's when you started that, you just don't get it until a couple of months and years later. But that quality of compassion that, and the trust, I think that a lot of communities maybe are lacking. And, and diving into a little deeper, I realized that it was, and it's cliche, but it, it really isn't about the chokes or submissions. It, no, it's, it's something even more meaning, meaningful. And I think I can't put it into words. I'm sure there's amazing, great people that that really uh, create a way to to navigate themselves through it and communicate about it. But I just find there's a huge connection. And I've been and I've trained all around the world. And I trained. Uh, even, I taught in Thailand. I taught in Puerto Rico. I've taught in in California. I've been and I, there's always a common a common principle about good people, quality training and being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I, I started to notice that vulnerability, um, first physical, of course, because my, my throat was so raw, I couldn't even sleep at night the first couple weeks, you know. Um, the school I started at didn't operate the same way that Easton does, where for the first couple of stripes on your white belt, you're not sparring. Well, 10, 10 classes in, we were sparring with uh, any other belt level in our school, and my, my throat, uh, it kept me up at night, but then, <laughs> but then I started to understand that there was an emotional and a mental and a spiritual component to jujitsu and martial arts like Muay Thai too. Do you see the correlation, the connection there? Absolutely. Uh, I started in stand up. My dad used to box, and he's the one who got me kind of like really more interested into it. But what tends to happen was your when your parents tend to teach you something, they tend to be like not the best teachers. <laughs> they like overcorrect you and make you feel shitty about what you're doing. But I started with more, um, striking arts. I think like that's a uh, that's a I do both and I'm I'm both uh, I compete in all fronts from grappling, jujitsu, muay thai, MMA. I I do enjoy both a lot. If I were to lean to one side more than the other, and life has seasons, so there's some seasons where I lean lean one to the other. Uh, I lean towards more Muay Thai, but when then there's a there's ability to like have a little more flexibility in my time, I lean more Jiu Jitsu. I think the the big com 
big compare the big things that bring it together is that I mean they both are they build structure in your life, right? They both build. You need to get these things these things done, and you need to do your best. So there's structure in both sides, and there's both understanding vulnerability to take care of your partner, uh, a sense of respect not only for your partner and the team and your teacher, but a sense of respect for yourself. How are you carrying yourself, right? Are you going to practice with the right mentality? Um, I'm just working on recently, my newest project is Muay Thai mentality, uh, Muay Thai mindset. Yeah, and in jiu-jitsu, like, you, you, you still get after it. It's an amazing workout. You're still crushing each other. You're still, like, trying to get your points or you try to get advantage. Uh, and Muay Thai, it's a little more slower pace. And I think because you're throwing shots, elbows, and knees. And, and, and Tha- when I was in Thailand, uh, Lin Choi, like, uh, light, 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 light. Light fight, light fight. Lin Choi, they'll consistently yell that to us because they want to preserve their bodies. They want to get quality repetitions. They want to educate their eyes. Their, they want their fight IQ to be a good place before the big show. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, it's like, you, you can go as hard as you want, right? And not get hurt. So that's, I think that's a really cool part about both styles that bring up a good way of control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that in my progression through jiu-jitsu where you know, a guy like me, a strength coach, you're a personal trainer, you're a CrossFit certified coach as well. A guys like me go in with just pure strength. And what I've learned about jujitsu and that vulnerability is that it's not about strength. It's a finesse and it's a technique and it's a mindset sport. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not present on the mat, no matter how strong you are, you're going to get beat. Yeah. <laughs> How was it the first couple of years for you, or first couple of months for you? How was it? You know, I I knew I enjoyed it from the beginning. Um, I almost primarily went to no-gi classes to start because, financially speaking, a, a gi was outside of my outside of my range on top of um, on top of the mem- membership every month. So I bided my time and I attended some no-gi slash wrestling classes uh, once a week, and then. After about 10 of those, maybe five of those, I started jumping into like midday gi classes that were a little lower intensity, um, more mindful in the practice on, uh, okay, three techniques and then positional drilling, and then uh, we can possibly spar afterwards because that wasn't necessarily a priority. I I didn't get into the sport for the fighting, but I've come to appreciate uh, the gentle art of jujitsu. Yeah, and that's what translates, right? Jiu-Jitsu is gentle. You try to explain that to some people, but they don't. They're like, I'm going to just dra- drive my elbow in your face. <laughs> You're like, uh, they're, they're, I mean, I think when I was, when I just got my black belt, and then it w- it's one of the high, most, there's a, a lot of accomplishments in my personal and business life, but getting my black belt was one of the biggest compliments I, I can I can't even bring it to words how, how it felt. But then I started realizing that the journey is never over. Once you have the, the, the achieved black belt, you really, and I hear, I heard it from my instructors so many times. They're like, it's just a bell once you get it, right? But then I kind of understood it once I got it. And there's like a difference between the art and the sport, right? And now once, once you start developing a great game and you got your, your, your your systems in place it starts transitioning from sport to art mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. i think that's the i think that's what keeps me go- coming on the mat it's the artistic side of it uh like it's still great it's still act- in- interactive with people but i think now i'm at a stage of my jujitsu where it's like the art form where like how can i be like move so el- so smooth without not much at all effort. And you see a lot of our great instructors, like Professor Ian, he just, like, he just doesn't, it seems like he's not doing nothing, but he just absolutely shuts everything down. And and I've been, and as and as a black belt, people think like, oh yeah, you're you're probably good at like, people, like just pe- passing people's cars, like nothing. I'm like, no, I still get fucking troubleshooting moments. Right, and I love Professor Ian, and, and I remember when I first rolled with him, he caught me in a triangle like six times, and I was just like, I haven't been triangled that much 
since I was a blue belt. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, now it's a, it's a great point we were saying before. Mm -hmm. The humbling nature of the sport is that no matter what belt level we achieve, we never arrive at that point of, of expert or perfection. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps me coming back is um, still at the blue belt level after two plus years. And um, I'll get trying for quite a few times. <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, what is what is your kind of game? Do you play? Are you more of a bottom player or a top player? Um, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Daniel. But to answer your question, um, when I came to Easton, my number one goal was to be a good teammate, and I went about that in my strategy of playing the bottom um, almost exclusively. Um, I knew that a weak point in my game was open guard. Yeah. And I knew that uh, kind of one of my areas of fear that I needed to get past was um, bottom half guard. Yeah. And as a, you're a strength coach and obviously a well, well-rounded uh, trainer from all, from all fronts. Like what, uh, what did, did you see like a great boost to your game that complemented your, your outside work? Oh, absolutely. Um, First of all, I'm a pretty intense person. I like to, I like to be all in or nothing. Yeah. And what jujitsu allows me to do is for three to five hours a week is to pour all of that intensity into um, a passion of mine so that I don't bring that over the top um, in your face type coaching to my clients and to my athletes. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what a, I mean, with the now it's bigger than ever. I think before when I started, it really isn't what, it, what we have now. And one of the big things I love about Easton and is that they have a, a structure where everyone can learn at a great pace. And, and I mean, until I was until I got into like yoga and personal training and CrossFit, you know, I I didn't really understand that much about how to really build people up, right? And I think my first modality was martial arts, right? And that, that gave me a good template of building people up. And I started seeing a comparison in other modalities as well. Uh, with, with you as a trainer and, and you're always looking to improve yourself in your jiu-jitsu and your everyday life, like has there been a point where jiu-jitsu has taken a lot from you that you didn't expect? I would say um, it's given me more than it's taken away. That's for sure. Okay, cool. Um, in, in maybe the first year, um, I was ending a relationship at this time, probably six to nine months into, the, into my jujitsu journey. And I was asked by the person I was living with at the time, uh, Dave, do you go to these classes to avoid coming home? And much, <laughs> much like in my professional life, um, I attend jujitsu classes so that I'm a better man off the mat than I am without it. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I like, I, that's, that's completely, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I think it's very fortunate to find something that helps us and builds us even further than we thought. Um, how do you, like, I think in jujitsu, we, we, we see like a lot of common injuries, right? What is the, what is the, one of the hardest injuries you've come across? Mm. Um, right at the time that um, I received my blue belt, um, I was probably training five or six days a week, um, hour and a half a day, maybe, maybe two hours a day. Um, I got a hip flexor injury <clears throat> from, um, from overuse, basically. Um, it was a repetitive motion syndrome injury on the front side of my hip. Um, but the first time I felt it was actually in a, in a standard deadlift, which I hadn't been doing in a really long time. Um, I was trying to keep my hips really, really strong and really healthy from the sumo stance deadlift. Yeah. And there was just one day that I decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to jump into this workout and I'm going to, I'm going to not test my max on the standard stance deadlift, but I definitely went pretty heavy. And that narrower stance that, um, with, internal rotation that we don't use very often in jujitsu. Yeah. We're most oftentimes externally rotated. 
Uh, I just felt that weakness and I, I dealt with that hip injury for about three months, probably right after I got my blue belt. Oh, wow. But the one thing that actually helped me is I attended a class at a gym locally called Awaken and it's a gymnastics type gym. And they showed us an exercise um, that actually in one or two um, kind of opportunities for me to perform this exercise, it actually fixed the injury. No way. Yeah. So and, and I, I recorded it and I have that on video and I share it with our jujitsu teammates when they have a similar injury so that they can get back on the mat as quickly as they possibly can. That's really, that's, man, that's, that's a huge bonus having someone kind of contribute to, to the community. And cause I think we all, we all intend tends to be like as, as, as athletes and as competitors, we just want to push ahead, right? We want to like, it's fine. No big deal. I'll get back on the mat. And then that's hard for us to understand. Like, no, there's something that's wrong. We should take some time to, to analyze it and get a bird's eye view of if this is the right thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember there was like my first professional fight I was training for and I, I was grappling with wrestlers is a nightmare. <laughs> Good wrestlers are, can definitely give you a tough time. And one of my training partners, he wrestled uh, in I think Penn state. He was one of the best training partners, great guy. And I was, we were both fighting together coming up. He, we were practicing, got caught into a leg entanglement, and we both were coming up. You would hear a huge pop. And I kid you not, it was like the loudest pop I've heard. It. Like, like, to this day, I, I think about that sound. And it was my uh, LCL, ACL, you know, it was my right side. I've never had an injury that severe in my life. And I was out close to a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, that started like a whole unbalancement of, of life. You know, it's like I was pronating here, the weight was distributing there, like I was walking a little different. Uh, and at that moment, you, you don't, like you, jujitsu does so much great stuff, but also puts you in a mind state of like, you know, you have nothing else but to, to move forward on this, right? I can't. Uh, which is interesting too. Like I had a lot of great friends at that community in the fitness and the physical therapy community. They were able to help me out. Kind of like you are so you were so nice to like give that resource to all our teammates. I had uh, a great. I had a, one of my friends and clients. He was a uh, doctor, and he was just he was one of my Muay Thai students, and he really took care of me and always was checked up on me and was very aware of like of my PT sessions and how I'm doing. Uh, when every, after a while, after I started feeling a lot better, I got back on the mat. It was the strangest feeling. <laughs> it was like, it was like a feeling like I, I can actually do this again. And, but it, you know, life definitely comes like if anything's, if something's worth the value, it does not come easy. Nothing worth it ever does. Yeah. Now, how long, uh, how long ago did you get your black belt and how long did it take? I got it in December 2nd of 2018. Yes. So about a year and a half now. A after baby, how, A baby black belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and after how long of training did it take you to, to reach that, that accomplishment? 10 years. And I hear that that's about uh, an average length of time. It's gonna take me longer. <laughs> it, it, it changes. Yeah. yeah. The thing I love about the sport is that it's such low impact on your joints, like ankle, knee, hip, and back, unlike running or, or Olympic lifting, that it can be a lifelong adventure no matter how old you are. Absolutely. As someone who's been doing it for so long, uh, and there tends to be this like idea of like, oh, you're going to, you're going to just get hurt all the time. Like, no, it's just actually, it's, you can get hurt in anything, right? But you can actually also be very aware of yourself. And you have great training partners that take care of you. You're in a great place. Uh, there, there really is, hasn't been a big, big point where I had to quit jujitsu. I mean, common injuries here or there. But it's just so engaging. It's so engaging. It's just so, um, it just really uses both parts of your mind and your body. 
right? And I've, I've done Olympic lifting. Um, I got my L1 years ago. And when I had my, I had my own studio back in Washington, D.C. It was called Fight Strong. And we taught yoga and martial arts and uh, more like boot camp. But I was running it uh, with a partner of mine who owned the CrossFit gym. So we, we kind of had the whole package deal. Uh, then that's how I started getting into Olympic lifting, which is still amazing and fun. And, but I, I, and I'm not at all putting down Oli or <laughs> Olympic or CrossFit at all. Uh, you know, I, I drank Kool-Aid. I enjoy it. <laughs> but uh, Jiu-Jitsu always became a consistent with me. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, if I was going to do this or I want to go do drill or grappling, I'm going to go grappling. <laughs> go, or I'm going to go hit some stuff. Yep. Uh, but it, it's all, it, in, a, in a way, just whatever can really fit you, mold you, and benefit your life. You know, let's celebrate that. Mm-hmm. I've always used the strength training as a complement to jujitsu. Um, I, do, I do realize that five or six days of training jujitsu, um, you can get those overuse injuries. Um, other than the hip injury, I think I've only broken my nose, chipped my tooth, and got a couple of bicep strains in three and a half years of training. So it's a pretty relatively safe sport. And if I train um, Olympic lifting one to two days a week, but strength training overall three to four days a week, then, then I can find a nice healthy balance and not overdo it, uh, which I can tend to do as a pretty intense person. But, you know. So with, the, with what we're going through now with the virus, how's that like, how, you adapt to your schedule, your training schedule, I assume. And what, is, what does that look like for you now? Man, I, w- I wish it could be the exact same as what it was a month ago, but um, uh, my roommate is a teammate. Uh, he's a three-stripe white belt, maybe four-stripe now. Uh, he's a good training partner, and we bought some mats for the house. So uh, <laughs> over the last week, awesome, uh, yeah. We've got, yeah, we've gotten the chance to train uh, at lunches and then um, when we're both free. Um, my strength training, though, on the other hand, has become just – primarily body weight exercises that I'm filming videos for my community at Fit Life Champions and um, making sure that they can do things at home. Um, It's not an area of strength of mine, but what I am strong at and what I'm good at is is building systems that deliver these programs to to my clients easily. So I record the video. um, I do the body weight workouts, which is um, definitely getting my heart rate up and I'm able to maintain my strength and conditioning. But is it my forte? Is it my passion? No, kettlebells and barbells and things like that are. I can still do the work um, as a well-rounded strength coach. You have to, and but delivering these programs to my clients is like my sweet spot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we got to be adaptable as possible now. And I think everyone's doing a really great job at that. They're looking great ways to to build, continue to practice and train. Um, there's nothing like it to be. You know, there's getting out of your head and into your body with my uh what i'm doing with a lot of my athletes is similar but i'm sending them some homework and i'm sending them some core exercises or a lot of dynamic depending if i'm if i'm coaching strikers it's going to be a different completely different program than a grappler and if it's like someone else that's really getting just their first time ever getting to moving then that's a completely different program uh the biggest components I think like that really helped me out with building people is just kind of they're available to, to be um, open-minded, right? I think that's the biggest tool is being open-minded and not let hurdles just tag you down. Like I don't have this, I don't have that. Like you have a chair, you have space, <laughs> you, you can download this app. It's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, I think the coachability and the flexibility in a client trainer relationship is critical to helping somebody reach their goals um, on their timeline because it's not about us as the coach. Yeah, and I mean, there everyone, and we all learn this from a predecessor teacher, like someone really inspired us. Right? And being a teacher is such a being that served place is such an important to us. Is there any specific teacher that really has inspired you and taken you to? Uh, to your path? Mm-hmm. I've had a couple of teachers in my experience um, that taught me what not to do. So 
uh, <laughs> I'll highlight the I'll highlight the ones who taught me really well. And uh, Lauren Landau is one of my mentors. Uh, he's a coach here for the Denver Broncos. Oh wow! And uh, he works with the Elevation Fight Team here at Easton. Um, at least his business does. So how I got introduced to him was through Metro State University where I graduated from. And he became a kind of a distant mentor or an online mentor for me. So his speed, agility, quickness workouts are something that I incorporate into my business. And I got the opportunity to, uh, to coach a 17 year old goalie for soccer in the fall of last year and able to take a lot of what Lauren taught us at Metro State and his interns and his team at Landau Performance and apply it to this kid who now has a pro contract with the Rapids. No way. That's, uh... He gets to live his dream every single day. And uh, the Rapids uh, training staff is posting videos of my client uh, performing at his highest level um, at a 17 year old kid. You're a proud papa. <laughs> he was he was the best to coach and train because he was so coachable and flexible and he's like you know what dave uh i trust you and uh and just help me get to the next level and we did it in eight weeks we took his uh power clean from just a basic learning introduction 95 pounds to 145 pounds and uh you know taught him per, uh, correct squat technique but also that speed agility quickness and and developing power with just his body weight was so impactful. And he's never done any similar training to that. Before. Not well, you know, <laughs> not well. There are some very good high school strength coaches out there, but not every high school has one. And uh, he was growing up through the Colorado Rapids um, youth development program here in Colorado. So uh, they have a strength coach. I've met him. Uh, he's a good presenter. He, he approaches coaching a lot like you do as a, mindset and as a science and he just has so many kids that he has to work with that it's all sports specific body weight training and less about the barbell which is the biggest bang for your buck when you're training for a professional athlete absolutely yeah yeah it's a in any sport you need a, a good solid strength conditioning coach when i started my amateur career it was just some programs that everyone was doing kind of like we were mentioning and I, I actually, one of my dear friends, he's been a strength conditioning coach at a high level for University of Maryland and for, the, for their football team. And he, he was willing to help me work with me. And that, I was 22 years old, I believe, at that time. And that it for sure elevated my amateur career. Uh, I really saw huge performance changes on like my last amateur fight. It was in Florida, and I was. It was like the what's called the WKA World Championships, and I went down there to represent the USA team. And my last opponent was actually Russian. It was like Rocky Four style <laughs> it, <laughs> versus a Russian. And, but I really felt my my performance was way better. Really working with my my coach Ross. His name's Ross Armstrong. Uh, and then after after that, we took a break. I saw like wasn't doing the right things again because teachers need teachers, coaches need coaches. And now I thought that I had it all figured out. So I kind of avoided that, I avoided my coach, to be honest. And I lost a, I went, went pro, lost my, lost a professional fight. I went back to him. I'm like, okay, let's do this again. And the next fight I was, I performed way better, but, uh, yeah, we always learn it from someone else and someone keep us accountable and in the right direction and not veer off the path is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all have influences, whether we ask for it or not. And, <laughs> and what's your what's your training uh, protocol now versus before since we have quarantine and and isolation as a piece, big piece of our lives? It is a big piece of our lives. And also being part of the Eastern community, there's like a plethora of training partners that we are blessed to have from so many different sizes experience they bring. So it's right now, it's kind of interesting that we're, we're not able to have that. What, I, what I'm doing now more actually is still body weight, still looking, still doing more of a Muay Thai box work, boxing workouts, 
a lot of jump rope, lateral work, um, balancing. As, uh, along with that, I tend to tackle it with a developing, a developing mindset in, in jiu-jitsu. I'm now doing a mind map where I'm looking at my positions and I already know what I'm really great at, but what's the, the, the gray area. So now I'm like, I have, I'm able to really write down my game and draw a tree out of what, what I would like to see my game look like when I get back on the mat. Uh, I'm, I tend to be more of a bottom player and most of my fighting career in jiu-jitsu or in MMA, I do really well on my back. And I'm also a great top player, but now it's like I can dissect it and really look at my, my films, look at my films, look at my data. Uh, the, 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 the sessions I, I rolled and recorded, I look at the small things. I have time to check back with my old coaches back home and they look at them. I ask them, like, what do you think I should have been working on? And they have time now. So they're able to be like, your head position was terrible. Like, oh, right, yeah. So I think that's a lot of body weight, a lot of uh, calisthenics, a lot of kettlebell work. Never drop the kettlebell. I always work on the kettlebell. And for the jitsu, I'm just writing my, uh, my mind map, my game out. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity that we have right now for rest, uh, recovery, letting our bodies um, repair. Because <laughs> yeah. jujitsu is hard on the body, but, <clears throat> but we can do it for life as long as we take care of ourselves. So, so that rest period, um, the mental focus is so key to stay present with the mind body connection while you're on the mat. Once we get back there. Right. Uh, the, the present part, it, it's so important. Um, and you can, the great thing about jujitsu also is that, you know, you, we meet so many people from different walks of life and they have so many interesting stories to share and, in a way, we can share those with a partner through our body. And I, I had a great uh, training partner of mine. He had a stuttering problem. Like he wasn't able to commu communicate really well. And we, when we got on the mat, I would try to talk to him. After a strong, hard rolling session, you, you, you build connection, right? There's absolutely that connection. You have a great rolling session. You played your game, they played your game. And you started entangling each other and get each other and you know, entangled. Then there's a connection. I think it was a great way for him to communicate himself through that. Uh, and because I guess he was shy because he had a stuttering problem. Uh, over time, he just was able to be a lot more open, a lot not, not so much reserved. And he puts it into his, in his words that jujitsu really changed the way he communicates now. And that's an incredible transformation story. And uh, I totally agree that everybody comes to jujitsu for a different reason, but we all end up one, one hell of a community, but also a whole lot further down the road than we ever would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. You know, but, go ahead. Yeah. And the community just keeps getting bigger. Uh, recently, I, when I went to Puerto Rico, I did a nonprofit project when Hurricane Maria uh, happened, the, the, the devastation in Puerto Rico, I was sent to Puerto Rico for a lot of for nonprofit relief projects. And in Puerto Rico, there was there's a, they're very heavy in boxing and in judo. There wasn't really a lot of jujitsu. Uh, I came there and I worked with a lot of people just to kind of get the morale up with the kids. And the community just kept on growing. This is like. Hurricane Maria was two years ago, I believe, or so. And I check on them on Facebook, and now they're like, they've grown so much. Now they have a black belt there, and their they're, they're, they're judo guy is doing jiu-jitsu, a purple belt. And it's growing in a great way, and it's, it's, it's beautiful to see. Yeah, that's a tremendous way to give back to a new community and expose them, uh, expose them to the, such a beautiful process and a lifelong journey. I haven't taught in Spanish in a long time, so that was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our areas of growth. And as I said at the very beginning, uh, we reconnected outside of Easton in, in the Mantox community last week. And what is it that draws you to uh, joining a men's group right now? I'm very, I'm very new or just still a beginner of this search of 
and, I, and this question could be just in different, come from different points, but what it is it to be a man? I, the, I, when I was growing up, I was raised by my mom and my parents were divorced and my dad was never in the picture. Uh, I had an older brother, but he still was trying to figure that out <laughs> as an older brother. What brought me to it was the questions that I was seeing that I could not answer. And I reached out to other great coaches and teachers and mentors, and they gave me their answer. But like Bruce Lee said, um, he is not, a teacher is not a giver of truth. He's only a provider of the journey. So it is our own, it is our own path to, to find our own answers. And there were answers I couldn't find of what is a man, what is my responsibility, what is it that I like to, to give out there into the world. And how can I crystallize that? Until these answers are, are, are met, I don't think I'm able to deliver what I want to the world. Yeah, I totally get that. And you're not alone. Um, a couple of years ago, I went through maybe the beginning stages of that question for myself at 30, 38 years old. Who knew that I was going to go through a midlife crisis and not realize it? You know, um, And the only way out is through. Uh, so I joined a couple of men's groups here locally in Denver and spent a year in one and continued to go um, every other week in the other, which is through my church and uh, just connecting and um, going deep with other like-minded men is the catalyst or is the kind of like the uh, incubator for that journey to solidify or the path to actually appear in front of us. One thing really great that of that conversation that we were part of was men don't check other men. And, and, and kind of to tie this a little bit with jujitsu, you get checked a lot in jujitsu, right? Your ego gets checked pretty quick, right? And with, and that brought, that actually got, put my flag up when, when they, when our, what our teacher was saying was like, men don't check other men. And we do live on our lives, it's just our own rides, and we don't feel like we'll celebrate someone if it comes to our side, but we really don't make the effort. And so I think like that's a big part of now that I'm learning. And, and since you have amazing positive uh, community with men, the, are you seeing a change? Are you seeing like a huge, like a, some, some shifting of mindsets? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've become a a better version of myself without even realizing that that was going to be a result. You know, I, I joined one of the men's groups to build better relationships with men because I had left behind many, many of my guy friends from my twenties and early thirties, um, discovering my own path to personal growth and, and development kind of took me away from that community of, you know, meeting up for beers and eating crappy food. And, um, some were not married, some were divorced, et cetera. So, you know, is this community of ego-driven conversations, you know, one-upping each other. And, and I have understood that there's no instant gratification in the work of becoming a man, becoming the best version of yourself. And even today, even in the last two or three weeks, because I'm feeling isolated for the first time in, in a year or so, and, and no man should be an island whatsoever. Um, we can be a, a grouping of a grouping of men that I like islands that touch each other through um, through proximity but I'm missing that connection because it was so important for so long and we're still connecting by a zoom we're still connecting by a phone call uh, but it's not quite the same because the authenticity in person the like giving each other crap and calling each other forth instead of calling each other out is something that men need, just like jujitsu. I go to jujitsu the same reason I go to a men's group so that I don't bring that shit home and basically negatively impact my personal life at home. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great space since I've joined and I've had a similar club before when I, when I was living in California, that was a period of my life where I was very lonely. Um, I was doing consulting work for martial arts uh, business. Uh, but at that time in my life, I, I felt very alone. 
And I had a partner. She was, she was uh, one of the reasons I moved to California. <laughs> My tip, don't ever move for a girl. But <laughs> and I, I really didn't have the, um, the support or, or a community of men. And my partner can only do so much, can only be so much. And it would be, and it wouldn't be uh, the best, the, it wouldn't be the best thing for me to, to ask more from my partner at that time. But I, I tremendously felt alone and I was able to find a group of, group of uh, jujitsu practitioners. Uh, and at that time I wasn't training because I had, a, I had um, my L5, my L4, my L5 were just like jacked up from some, some, something different. And I wasn't able to train, so I was like stuck. I was like, I can't train. And but these 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 this group of this tribe, of jiu-jitsu practitioners, guys, they were so open to just hang out. Like, oh yeah, just come out and hang out at the gym. You don't have to like train. And then that's what I did. I just sat back on the sidelines and just hung out with them and talked to them. Uh, very level people, and that actually saved me all close to like depression at that time in my life. Mm-hmm. And I get that, that the responsibility is not our partners to raise us from a boy to a man. That's, that's a part of a, that's a part of our generation being raised mostly by women that it has become a very bad habit where we put that responsibility on our partner to, to initiate us into manhood. And that's not what that's for. Mm -hmm. Uh, The, the female or the, excuse me, the partner in our life is the icing on our, on the cake, not the, not the ingredient, not the oven, not the process of the recipe. They're just the icing on the cake. And, and the most important thing for an athlete when they are injured is to stay a part of a community, mm-hmm. whether they're a track athlete, a football athlete. That's why injured athletes still travel with the team is because they need to be a part and not isolated and not um, excommunicated from the culture of the locker room for one, but also the competition. Mm-hmm. I was going to uh, throw an idea with you, and this is just has been jumping on my head. And, and the way you're the way you're you're telling me about the way you're looking at life, and I was thinking about because we're so because jujitsu brings us together, and that community is important, and we're able to be engaged. You can do a play a play by play jujitsu through the web. So if I say, "Hey, Dave, I mounted you," what are you going to do? You would say. Right. Yeah. I might go, might go need an elbow escape there. Okay. So now I'm in your half guard because I shut that down. Mm-hmm. Do you see what's happening? <laughs> yeah. I understand. Like we're kind of role playing um, a jujitsu match scenario where we have to respond to our partner's movement. Yeah. And that can help you develop your mind map, but it can also help develop our, our underbelts to, uh, troubleshoot when they're not on the mat. It's a, it's a very literal way of visualization training, which is a key component of all professional sports. Right, right, absolutely. And it also brings people together, right? It's like mm-hmm. we're playing this chess game mm-hmm. <laughs> to each other. If I call out this move, you call out that move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you said you've done a little bit of striking too before. What's, um, what is your history with that? I actually started boxing. Um, about five or six years ago, um, I'd gone through a breakup with the girl that I was telling you about. We eventually got back together, but in that summer, about shoot six years ago now, um, I picked up Olympic lifting three days a week, and then I started boxing in a group class three days a week. And the learning of the combinations is very important to keep me mentally sharp, but also the cathartic experience of connecting well on a uh, fight light, you know, you were talking about it earlier, where it's not about power, it's just about connecting well with the mitts. And I enjoyed the cardio component of it. Um, actually, the, the training that summer caused a herniated adductor in my right hip, the same hip that got injured during jujitsu. Yeah. And I still have this herniated muscle. It actually looks pretty ugly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's... Uh, it's a muscle that sticks through the, the fascial layer and it actually is right underneath the skin. So um, it doesn't bother me much anymore because I, I haven't boxed in a while, but um, holding the mitts or hitting the mitts and learning the combination to get it 
as good as I possibly can. It, it's never going to be perfect as far as my striking goes. Um, but that's where I started is uh, I boxed for about three years and then I got into the jujitsu. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Which, um, and then holding mitts is a skill of its own. Absolutely. I mean, you see Freddie Roach with Manny Pacquiao. That is beautiful destruction at its best. <laughs> many, 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 many hours of symbiotic movements between the two of them. Yeah, absolutely. And now, like my, what I'm doing now is with the Eastern community, with the Muay Thai community, I'm helping their teachers become better teachers. Uh, and not only in the, in the framework of pads, but also building concepts, being able to translate their, their thoughts into words as to become better coaches and teachers. And mm -hmm. I think this, and I, I picked up uh, so many great, from just different modalities from the CrossFit world, from the yoga world, just great tools, teaching tools. And I think like the, the now spreading it down to our, to our team, the Easton's, it's a I'm very, very fortunate to be part of the team. And they're very fortunate for them to let me play around with their coaches and kind of give them some pointers. Man, if, I mean, if we all, uh, rising tides raise all ships, right? And shoot, man, if the Easton community gets any better, they're going to be indestructible. That's the goal. <laughs> Well, Daniel, I know that your time is valuable. So if your message resonates with our audience, how, how do they get a hold of you? What's the best way? Sure. Um, you can definitely go on my website. It's coachdannychacon.com. You can go to my Instagram handle, dcdreamer13. Those are the two best ways to get in contact with me. If you're, if you're looking to enhance your jiu-jitsu, you're looking to enhance more of your Muay Thai striking, or if you're developing an, uh, an itch to try martial arts, and I will, I definitely would, you know, I, would, I welcome all students. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing your your story and your journey. And um, when that Easton Academy opens back up, hopefully by the end of April, beginning of May, uh, we'll get a sparring session in, and uh, we'll hit the mitts. I would love to, man. That'll be a great great time, man. Sweet. Awesome. Well, before I let you go, is there anything that you want to leave us with? Any thoughts, any, um, any lessons and learnings? Absolutely. Um, one of the best quotes um, that's got me through our challenging times is the world doesn't need a Superman or a superwoman. They just need a brave one. So if we can just be brave and courageous throughout this hard times, we can take it day by day. And that's, and that's, that's a win out of its own. Yeah, I completely agree. Just day by day. And um, I'm more empowered and renewed in my passion for my purpose through jujitsu, uh, fitness and nutrition to improve mental health than ever before. I think it's because of that rest period and that time to recover and to stay within my own lane because I can only do so much right now. And the bravery that it takes to take one step at a time uh, moving forward is the true lesson to be learned out of this moment. I could easily sit on the couch 12 hours a day and nobody would give me a hard time. They would forgive me eventually for that. But that would be a, a waste of my opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Danny. I really appreciate it. And let's stay connected through Man Talks and through Instagram and through the Easton community because I think we can only... Uh, raise those ships with the rising tide better let's, together. Let's do it, brother. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.